Well, last class, and I, sadly, this looks like it's going to be part three of the work of forming and conforming. It, it was a little strange, though, that when I looked down, I thought it said the work of foaming and conforming, but it didn't. It was, it was. <clears throat> All right, what we were uh, specifically looking at in relationship to the Luke 15 story of the prodigal son was <clears throat> that when he began to mature, he thought maturity was that you get strong and you go and you do great things and this sort of thing. And um, that's verse 11 and 12, but in verse 18, he comes back and he says that I am not worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thine hired servants. So the first one was give me the goods. <laughs> give me the goods. <clears throat> Sound like a robbery. Um, <laughs> And <laughs> give me the goods and I'm out of here. Uh, but when he came back, it was make me as, but, and, and we, I think we've embraced the making process. I just don't think we've really, really truly embraced that the making process in the eyes of the Father is to lose all the ambition and all the things that we think are going to make us great because. You know, it's my time, you know. You know it's, yeah. I mean, I remember a year ago or two, uh, we said, uh, you know, it's, it's Jesus' time. It's his time. Remember that? I didn't have the heart to tell you, but it's always his time. <laughs> um, to shine out of us. To shine out of us. <clears throat> All right, so uh, we said that he went out making himself great, but uh, suddenly in the eyes of the Father, <clears throat> now he truly is great because he says, make me lower than not just the son, not just a son, but a hired servant, which Jesus said, I'm not come to be ministered unto, but to minister and to... <clears throat> And, and he that is greatest will be servant of all. And these are, these, are, these are real realities, but we have to move them from real realities of theology into real realities of how to think and perceive. And we, that doesn't come, that's, that's not going to come to us. It's not. It's going to come by him who is in us. And that's the only way it's going to happen. <clears throat> so we were talking about that. Uh, turn with me, if you will, to Matthew 18. <clears throat> Excusez-moi, s'il vous plaît. I'm hoping this coffee will wash away the... Mm -hmm. Blow out the carburetor. <clears throat> And release the flu. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I am kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> We're going to look at verses 1 through 5. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? There you have it. <clears throat> now, I'm sure that this probably wasn't the first two weeks. This probably happened after they'd been with him a good while. And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and be as, a little, as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. All right. All right, so... Does that mean if you receive a kid, it's the same as receiving Jesus? No, he's talking about a certain spirit. He's talking about a certain um, <clears throat> uh, demeanor based on God, not just circumstances or, or little, little people. And it came up talking about who's the greatest. 
who's the greatest? Okay. And, you know, it's sad, but I think that people tend to, anytime they go into a place, they, you know, find out who's this and that and that, and they, they start honoring and dishonoring according to that or whatever. I mean, I remember we used to go to Mardi Gras all the time. I remember it was Scott or somebody asked the pastor there, who do you think is the pastor of New Creation Fellowship? And they never picked me. <laughs> <laughs> Which, there's something to be said for discernment. <clears throat> anyway. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so who is the greatest? And Jesus called a little child unto him. Okay, so he said, uh, so here's Jesus' thing. He says, except you be converted, you're not converted. Your mind is not converted. You're the true, you know, now we think of conversion as uh, getting saved and that sort of thing. They're already with Jesus. They're already following Jesus. But their mind and their understanding and their viewpoint has not been converted to that of God or that of the mind of the Lamb or that of, it really doesn't matter what you call it, it's the exact opposite of us. <laughs> That's the deal. You know, we can put labels on it and think we got it or think because we talk about it a whole lot that we got it. But in reality, Jesus said, look, None of you, unless you're converted to this mentality, and he didn't say, now little children automatically are converted to this. He didn't because they don't have the mind of Christ. They don't have this viewpoint. But they are lowly, they are under, they are not trying to, you know, be an adult or something. You don't do that until you hit your teens or something like that. So Jesus says, except you be converted, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, you will not have the government that is my kingdom. You have to be converted to this. <clears throat> um, and uh, Whosoever shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom. And whosoever shall receive one such child in my name, receiveth me. Okay, so this isn't receiving children in his name. This is learning, this is tough, learning to spot the one who took the lowest seat and receive them as if you're receiving Jesus because it's a good chance that he may have took that seat because it was Jesus. See, but you'll never, society, churches, it's all messed up in this regard. And we don't spot those things. We don't see those automatically. We don't go, ah, there's Christ. A lot of times, no matter how much we've been taught and whatever, we may regard based on other things other than identifying the lamb. Now it gets it gets difficult <clears throat> because, um, for example, when I was in Bible school and God was starting to teach me about the lamb, I found that it was very easy to submit and to lay down my life and to, I mean, you know, not instantly, but I mean, I'm saying I, after a while, I I could flow with that. But then when I became a leader. I didn't know how to be a lamb. It was like, you know, I got a lead here, you know? And it actually took, the only way I could really handle it is it took the spirit of the lamb for me to lay down my life and be a leader. <laughs> Does that sound crazy? Well, someone would go, wow, he just wants to be somebody. <laughs> and I'm going, I'm laying down my life to do this. I do not want this. Anyway, so let's, let's look in Matthew 13. <clears throat> Matthew 13, verse 31 and 32. 
Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven, notice the subject again, is like to a grain of mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. All right. So he's saying that this Jesus is honoring a mustard seed. You know, of all your creation <laughs> and everything you made, how about an elephant, you know, or something, you know, all, all that, and you're sitting there holding a mustard seed going, you see, you know, you can barely hold it, you know. This is the least of all, but because of that, it, can be, it is to me and to my view and to my father's view the greatest. And it can fill where the greatest cannot fill. I hope that, I mean, there's, work, there's, there's spirit meaning behind that when I said that. Um, so Jesus is constantly doing this, and that'd be a good challenge for you, and I've done it, and I've done it, and I've stayed with it. I have, I have stayed with an area regarding this for three years and still going. And I have not yet shared the, the heart of this with anybody. I read it to one person, but I have not. Because, frankly, I was telling Scott and Jim there, I said, frankly, a lot of what I share right now, some people just can't take anyway. So if they don't, if they, if they don't like it or can't handle it, I am in danger of making them, by casting it before them, making them become casting it before swine. So I'll withhold that so that they can grow and grasp and be with the Lord. Anyway. Um, so let's go to uh, 1 John 4.4. 4. Year of God, little children. That's little teak nuns, <laughs> little family, <laughs> family sons, but not, yeah, kiddo, kiddos, yeah. Uh, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Okay, so we talk about the greater one being in us, right? And, the, and I've heard over the years when people talk about the greater one being in me, that means they're great, greater now. The greater one lives in me. Am I right or wrong? I mean, I know you've seen it or heard it. It's like, well, the greater one lives in me. You know, and they sort of, you know, whatever. Okay. <clears throat> Jesus is the greater one. But look at where he's at. He's not on a throne, I mean, you know, but he's not, not in this, not based on what he's trying to communicate. He's not on a throne up there. He's in you. Or he's in you. You. He's in me. Come on, the Son of God, the Holy, the one who made everything, that rules all things, and he's stuck inside of us. This stuff going on all the time, and he's in there. That's called taking a lower seat. My God, my Lord. That's the greater one. <laughs> there is the Father goes, there's my son. That's, his, that's the spirit that I want emanating out of them, not just being great sitting in a, 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 a decrepit tomb of a, body or a, of a person or a personality or an attitude he is he is desiring that that same light shine out of us that that same nature fill us and therefore this mind that's because it, it is that same mind it's a greater mind 
it's a greater mind. But it goes down when you go up. It's a greater mind. And so, but just trying to shove those kind of thoughts of being lower on a regular basis, moment by moment, is impossible. Because you got, you got a war going on in there. Well, it's really not much of a war because our thoughts of whatever, somebody abused me or somebody did this, we, it just runs over the top of the lamb sitting there in a chair in the lower seat. <laughs> you know, just, you know, just mauls him down and goes, you know, this ain't stands up and this ain't right. And, you know, that's, you, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And it's like Jesus is still sitting over there, and if we didn't maul him over and knock him down out of his chair, he's quietly picking it up and sitting in the lower seat again. The greater one is in us. <laughs> That's pretty great that he would be that way inside of us. So he is continually confronted with attitudes and ways of thinking and stuff like that. <clears throat> All right, so... We all know that scripture, but let's, let's start at verse 1, chapter 4, 1 John 4, 1. Beloved, and John's a pretty good guy too. Believe not every spirit. Okay, so <clears throat> he's not just talking about... Um, discerning of spirits, whether that's a demon. He's saying what, what's of God and what's not of God. Okay. Well, how are we going to know what's really of God and what's not of God since we can't read people's minds? Or we can't see them at every given moment? Or we can't, how are we going to know what's of God and not of God? Well, he's going to explain that. <laughs> Isn't that cool? He's going to explain that. Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Okay, so when he says many false prophets, he's talking about people who say that they're prophets, big shots. He's saying that these people are promoting themselves, you know, presenting themselves as somebody that should be listened to and of, and of importance. And so then he says, so hereby know ye the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. It's not talking about 2,000 years ago. It's talking about, I believe Jesus lives in me. I believe it's his life in me. See, we put everything off to the future, and we don't let it be Christ now. And he's saying, this, this is how you'll know someone's of God. Not I, but Christ. He must increase. I must decrease. Do you, you see that? And, it's a, and we can do that religi you know, religiously, and I don't mean continually, because that's the way you say religiously means continually. I mean, you know... Um, I, I believe that I'm crucified with Christ and Christ lives in me. But are you talking about the doctrine or are you saying, I believe that so that when I get into a situation, I, I think my, it's, no, no, it's fine. Um, Deb and I were talking on the way here and she was commenting on something that I shared yesterday. And um, it was out of First Peter, what was it, 4? The, the, um, um, the shepherd of our souls. Shepherd. We were a sheep gone astray. Well, if you heard my sharing or whatever, I went through First Peter and I showed in every chapter that the thing he was talking about is that this nature and this spirit be what come out of us, that it's the real thing, it's not a teaching and whatever. And so she was commenting on that and I said, I didn't say, but I had already had it written down 
but I was meditating on it, and that was what I had written down way prior to that, was that our souls shepherd us instead of him. And we get in a situation and our soul starts dictating and lead, telling us to follow and telling us to go and to be this way and to think this way and to show this attitude and to do this and that. That's our soul. And he's not shepherding our soul. And the only way that we can claim he's shepherding our soul is when that stuff comes up and we go, uh-uh, uh-uh, I follow him. I'm with him. I'm not me. I am crucified. That's my life. And I know he doesn't think that way. And, and Lord, let that spirit of God, let that mind be, fight for something worthwhile. Or is it worthwhile? And that's the thing. That's the thing. Have we, is it worthwhile? Has it become ver worthwhile so much so that he can shepherd our soul instead of our soul shepherding us? And when the main place it talks about Jesus being a shepherd is John 10. And in John 10, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. That's it. There it is. It's always there. You can't go far. It's always there. So he's saying, if he's saying, follow me, he's saying, follow the way I am. I'm a good shepherd. I want to shepherd you. I've laid down my life for you by put and then put my life in you so that you could do this. But you have to, so here brings it back around now. So you have to say, not I, but Christ. You can't theologically just do that or you're dulling your senses to the Holy Spirit and you're living in a, in a false reality that is not being shepherded by the good shepherd who gives his life and wants you to. Okay, well, so I try to, hope y'all don't mind, but I try to shoot more straight than I ever have because I, I know that, I know that you want Jesus. I know that you want Jesus. And these things are, if they're, you know, you tell me in area of importance. You know, I had someone tell me recently, well, you know, this, this stuff that you teach, that's not that important. What's important is 1 Corinthians 15, that Jesus died and rose again, and we all believe that. And I was just going, okay. I quit again. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to try to finish this out because we've run over a little bit and, and I know that's bad. All right. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ is, not did, but is come in the flesh, come in our flesh. Praise God. But wait, look at this. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God. Okay, so he's not just say, talking about saying it, confession. He's, he's saying if you, don't, if you don't say it, you certainly don't believe it. But he's talking about antichrist, which we'll get in just a second. It's antichrist in you. It's not just anti, oh, I just generally don't like Christ, whatever, in general. You know, I'm against him. <laughs> it's not that. He's anti-Christ in him, whether he says it or not. He's a false prophet. He's making himself something instead of it being Christ. And so this is, this is the, the, the way to discern that spirit. Okay, but he goes on. <clears throat> And this is that spirit of Antichrist. This is not for Christ in you. Oh, I believe that. I've written, I've written books on Christ in you. <laughs> Do you get my drift on this? Who cares? 
Who cares? Some of you may remember, it was about a year ago, I guess, I, I said somebody disagreed that was in the Bible school at the time with, with my teaching, and I said, in, next time you come up with something you disagree with, you bring that book, and I said, in fact, you can gather up all my books and tapes and everything, and we'll go out in this backyard, and I'll burn them all before your eyes if that'll make you happy. How many of you believe I'd really do that? Oh, I'd do it. I would do it. I could care less about books and stuff. You know, especially mine. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Come on, I know me, you know. I just want the Lord here. And if I, if I cared anything about you, I'd want the Lord there also. See, in this spirit, in this way. Um, and this is, this is, so he goes and John goes, and this is that spirit of Antichrist. They're prophets. They say they're prophets. They don't call themselves false prophets. They call themselves prophets. But they are not living by the life of Christ within them in this way, in this manner. Whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is, <clears throat> is it in the world. But ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them because. What is your victory over that self-promotion spirit? Greater is <laughs> But it has to be really, he's greater than me. He, he's, he's able to rise up against my soul and shepherd it. That's, now that's greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world, you know. And, and the, well, he starts, he, he talks about the love of the flesh and the love of the eyes and the pride of life and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, it's, it is... All see, and we can't. We really have a hard time discerning through this. I know I need to quit. We have a hard time discerning through this because that that veil has been pulled back, and a new mind grip you, and then you go, "I will not leave this." And that's the other reason why I hadn't shared this. I will not leave this till it's in me, in me, in me, in me. will not but I will get it and I will get it and it'll be it'll be a joy of the father that the son can shepherd my soul and that he can he can override any faculty in this shack called a temple <laughs> anyway let's pray Lord, we thank you so much for you, for you, because you are greater than us, because we would promote ourselves, you would take the lower seat. We thank you for you, because you are greater than us, who would, when reviled, we would revile back. <clears throat> You are greater than us, but you're supposed to be that way in us. Not just greater because you're that way in general, but greater are you in us. So that you can shepherd our souls, those souls that as the scripture says in the same sentence, we are like sheep that have gone astray. And we go astray all the time. Each one turn to his own way. But we don't want to be our own. We want to be yours and all that that means. Yours. Yours, Jesus, as a, as a bride. As yours. We want to be yours. So that when you turn one direction, we 
just go with you, not because you're a shepherd, but because you're shepherding our souls. Not because you're external to us, but because you're in us. And you fill us, and we talk about you filling us, but we fill ourselves, and we shepherd our souls. And we never get condemned or convicted over it. And Lord, we want to come to a place where that is no longer allowed in us, by us, no longer allowed. We want you to be all the things that you said you would be, husband and shepherd and all those things, vine that flows in and brings forth what comes out of us, all that great teaching that just has very little effect in our lives. And we want you to not let us up, not let us up, not let us, not just turn your back and let us go astray, but to press us to the truth and to, and to not let us leave like we have a million times, a thousand, whatever, a hundred times before and forget what was shared and have no impact. But if it's true and if it's from your heart, and if it's important to you, may we make it important to us. May we make it important. Because you shepherd our souls and you husband us. And Father, you father us into the spirit. So we love you. And we thank you. And we bless you. In Jesus' name, Father. Amen.